uh, is a tremendous honor to welcome Professor Richard Wolin of uh, the City University of New York once again to the show. Uh, we are here today to discuss an essay that he wrote on Liberty's Journal. It is titled The Cult of Carl Schmidt. And as he has disclosed earlier for me to me before we begin recording, it is uh, scheduled to be turned into a book. So uh, if uh, that is uh, permitted, uh, tell us uh, a little bit about what the book is going to be. Sure, Sean. Thanks again <clears throat> for having me uh, once more. I enjoyed our last conversation on Heidegger. Thank you. And uh, that that Heidegger book got a bit out of hand. Uh, so uh, enough said. So this is intended to be uh, a much shorter book. Uh, pithy, hopefully, although Schmidt is a very complex topic these days. Uh, his his work is. Uh, voluminous, mm -hmm. and recently we've had several volumes of diaries previously unac unaccessible that have been published. And then there's the conundrum of the Schmidt reception, which, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, has gone through the roof, especially since uh, the attacks of 9-11, where uh, the idea of the uh, emergency situation, state of exception, according to Schmidt, uh, was so widely discussed. So there was a, a and it's fascinating, there's been both this right, right wing uh, reception of Schmidt, uh, again, with the, uh, you know, inroads, the rise of authoritarian populism. It seems that, that Schmidt's notion of pleb plebiscitary uh, democracy, plebiscitary authoritarian democracy, uh, it seems that he was quite prescient in this respect in his critique of, of uh, parliamentary democracy in 1923 already. Uh, and uh, I think that the important point is that on the basis of some of the new material we have, uh, especially, for example, two and a half years ago, Schmidt's writings uh, during the Nazi era from 33 to 36 were made available in German. Otherwise, they were very difficult to access. Many appear in uh, uh, his, his, his first commentaries on the uh, Nazi Caesar power appeared in uh, newspaper articles. Uh, Schmidt was very active in the public sphere. There are interviews. There, these are a series of fascinating commentaries on the transformation of Germany from to use the German expression, a Reichstag, a rule of law, uh, to a, 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 Führer, a Führer, Führer state, a uh, leadership state, um, which Schmidt countenanced and, and supported. Of course, he wrote important uh, Gleichschaltung uh, or you know, uh, legislation to uh, eliminate the uh, individual states, uh, et cetera. So uh, what I would like to do basically on the basis of these new materials, uh, the diaries are especially fascinating because they reveal the, you know, the inner workings of Schmidt's mind, so to speak, and his, his commentaries, private commentaries on the events of the day, which are of course uh, world historical, one might say. And, and this, is an, this is an attempt I, to, to, to bring it to a focus the focal point of uh, my uh, book and my thesis more or less is that the key to understanding Schmidt is really in his early writings through the, the, the critique of parliamentary democracy in 23, uh, especially Schmidt's interest in the counter, so-called counter-revolutionary uh, mindset or, or Catholic counter-revolutionary philosophers of state uh, so this is Joseph de Mestre, Louis de Bonal, and, and Donoso Cortez, the Spanish counter-revolutionary who was very important for Schmidt. Schmidt planned to write a book on him. And so, so the, the, the defense of Schmidt, uh, he's such a complicated thinker. There are various stages. The defense of Schmidt focuses on his conduct during the late Weimar Republic from 20, 29 to 33 
and it maintains that uh, all Schmidt's interventions and his attempt to strengthen presidential rule at the expense of expense of the Reichstag or the German Parliament uh, was intended to save German democracy. Uh, if I could interject uh, a very minor note of humor uh, with with people like. Carl Schmidt saving democracy, one really doesn't need enemies. So based on my, my thesis is that uh, Schmidt during the, the mid twenties, when the challenges from left and right to the Weimar Republic had ceased, Schmidt basically accommodated himself to the framework of the Weimar constitution, uh, arguing for uh, uh, strong presidential rule consistently. Mm -hmm. um, and if one, one goes back, I think, and reconstructs the early writings, already his inaugural lecture as a professor uh, uh, at a relatively young age in 1916 uh, at, at the University of Strasbourg, uh, a, uh, a city that had been conquered, uh, annexed from France in the uh, Franco-Prussian uh, War of 1870-1871, uh, uh, Schmidt is already talking about state state law under state of speech, okay, martial law, uh, because they're in the middle of World War I, right? So how does law change in times of war? This is an important topic. Uh, there's a famous, uh, I'll stop in a second. There's a famous maxim by the uh, Roman uh, poet and philosopher Horace, uh, well known that in times of war, the, the laws are silent which gives one an idea. So Schmidt's fascinated by this problem. And then I think it's very important to acknowledge that he was stationed in Munich uh, as an advisor to the German general staff, legal advisor during World War I. And he was in charge of one might say some, something like counterintelligence. He was uh, you know, looking for uh, you know, dissidents uh, or anti-war Germans who were residing in Switzerland at the time. Ironically, uh, one of those uh, anti-war dissidents was Walter Benjamin, who had sought refuge in Switzerland, who later would write to Schmidt about his notion of sovereignty, Schmidt's notion of sovereignty. Uh, but, but I think, of course, you know, uh, to conclude, uh, you, you have this uh, oscillation between red and white terror in uh, Munich in 1919 with the uh, Munich, uh, the government of social democratic government of Kurt Eisner, who was assassinated in February, 1919. And then you had this uh, Soviet Republic, a short lived Soviet Republic followed by white terror. I think these were formative experiences for Schmidt. If one, one tunes in to the, uh, you know, the dominant news reports uh, and, and political discussion uh, in 1919 in Europe, of course, there's a great fear of Bolshevism. This is when the Nazi party was formed in Munich, in fact, uh, an outgrowth of this uh, so-called uh, tool society, T-H-U-L-E, Tula Gesellschaft or society. So this was extremely influential. There's a, a, a Soviet Republic, a council Republic in, in, in uh, Budapest, as you know, uh, and of course, also uh, the events in the Soviet Union. So I think this, this, uh, you know, first, these firsthand experiences with the specter of uh, Bolshevism, or one might even say Jewish Bolshevism, which was a term that was bandied about by the right at this time, were formative experiences. Therefore, the transition in 1933 uh, on Schmidt's part to defensive dictatorship, he writes this important book in 1921, uh, Treatise on Dictatorship, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, argument, uh, this distinction between what he calls sovereign and commissarial dictatorships. Sovereign dictatorships are the left-wing dictatorships, Robespierre, Lenin, etc., uh, which are all to totalitarian. Ernst Nolte, the German historian, uses the same argument in the course of the, the historian's dispute and, and uh, his subsequent work. Uh, so so uh, I think this is you know, the, the basis for uh, a new interpretation of Schmidt. Schmidt's convinced that uh, it's in the early 20s, it's a question of a left-wing dictatorship or a right-wing dictatorship. And that problem uh, is submerged during the five years of stability environment from 24 to 29. And then during the crises that are pre 
precipitated by the, the great economic crash and Nazism's political breakthrough, uh, the field opens up again in different ways. Um, so, so basically I, I take uh, Schmidt's defense of political dictatorship as uh, you know, almost a, 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 a sacred uh, response uh, against godless communism. He actually uses this phrase citing Bakunin uh, in political theology. Uh, I, I think this is a, a, a prominent leitmotif in the, the whole of Schmidt's work and one can't understand uh, the, the, uh, you know, the sweep of his writing unless one takes this, this, these early developments seriously. Um, on that um, solid and detailed uh, foundation, uh, I'd like to refer to an essay which uh, you've uh, authored in the, published in the journal Political Theory in 1922, um, is titled uh, Carl Schmitt, The Conservative Revolutionary Habitus and the Aesthetics of Horror. And of course, uh, you refer to Carl Schmitt as the conservative revolutionary, which at first glance may sound like an oxymoron. So uh, uh, tell me about how you, you believe uh, Schmidt warns this uh, label. Sure, that's an important question. And the whole notion of the conservative revolution is in dispute in the secondary literature, whether they're one can call this, subsume these family resemblances of thinkers like Schmidt, uh, Ernst Junger, uh, Heidegger, perhaps, uh, Oswald Spengler under this concept. Uh, but to go back to the, the you know, meaning of the concept, it's, it's, as you suggested, it's an oxymoron. How can someone who's a revolutionary also be conservative? But it's important because it captures the gist of the new self-understanding of German conservatives, national conservatives, radical conservatives, we call them too, after World War I. After World War I, of course, the uh, Central European monarchies uh, in Germany, Hohenzollern, Austria, the Habsburgs, uh, have dissolved. And uh, there's only you know, seemingly one way forward in the direction of some form of democracy. So the, the German conservatives, of course, uh, you know, almost all of whom are uh, outraged by the punitive quality of the Versailles Treaty, uh, have to reconceive conservatism away from its traditional, uh, you know, uh, royalist, it wasn't quite feudal, of course, uh, you know, uh, under uh, the, the Kaiserreich, they call it, the Second Empire, totally reconceived German conservative. What happened in a nutshell, is that the whole development is summarized by a book title uh, by another German conservative revolutionary, uh, Hans Freyer, uh, from 1930, uh, not translated into English yet, uh, called Revolution from the Right. In essence, the, uh, uh, with a few exceptions, the many conservative, Conservative intellectuals, radical conservative intellectuals, uh, overtook the thesis of Lenin that the wave of the future is dictatorship and strong rule, uh, and they wanted to make these uh, precepts, the idea of dictatorship, serviceable for the political right. Okay, uh, Schmidt for for cast all these developments in his arguments against parliamentarism in 1923, his argument in favor of a plebiscitary dictator, plebiscitary rule, plebiscitary dictatorship. In German, there's a nice term to describe it. Uh, in English, it would be leadership democracy. Max Weber uses this title. Uh, or, you know, in German, it's uh, Führer Demokratie. Um, that's the, the way forward. And they, they, the, the conservative revolutionaries to a person, Spengler, Mutter van den Broek, uh, you know, Junger, were convinced that the, the way forward for Germany in a manner that was consistent with German authoritarian political traditions would be dictatorship. That's why Schmidt's book of 1921 is so important and so prescient. Uh, but, but all his early, early books especially uh, are relevant to this problem. And, uh, you know, there, there's a, a, a 
seriousness with which Schmidt and an honesty with which he works through the problems of political democracy. This is one of the reasons for his, uh, you know, astonishing relevance and popularity right now, because of course our democracies are uh, in, in crisis um, for, for reasons that would take a long time to enumerate. Uh, and, and Schmidt had insight into the failings and flaws of uh, contemporary democracy, 20th century democracy, liberal democracy. So uh, the, the conservative revolutionaries uh, believed that uh, one needed a revolution from the right. Right-wing Leninism, uh, one might say, with a couple of qualifications. Of course, it's a, it's a national, with small n, small s, it's a national socialism. Okay, uh, that's what Spengler argued uh, in 1919 with the small book, uh, Prussianism or Socialism. Uh, he wanted Prussian socialism where the values were not, you know, uh, Marxist uh, or, or oriented toward, uh, you know, uh, social international socialism but, or led by trade unions, but uh, oriented toward the, the Prussian values of duty and obedience uh, and uh, military virtue, uh, traditional Prussian values. This is a, a also a very Prussian book. Mm -hmm. So I would like to mention also Schmitz's um, 1927 work, which arguably arguably is, is most well known, uh, the concept of the political, which coincidentally was published at the same year as Heidegger's most famous work, Being in Time, Sign and Sight. And in it, he theorized that the essence of politics is the distinction yeah. between friend and enemy, in other words, tribalism. So what uh, what was uh, Schmitz's reasoning behind this particular distinction? Yes, that, that distinction has come back in vogue of sorts. And uh, I think part of the reason that the concept of the political has been successful uh, is that it's it's so pithy. Uh, it was originally published as an essay. He republished different editions of it, especially in in uh, 33, where he changed, uh, he, he extruded a, an allusion in the footnote to uh, George Lukacs and history and class consciousness. Mm -hmm. But I think that one, one important uh, feature of the book is that in, in uh, arguing that this friend enemy distinction is uh, the important uh, distinguishing feature of uh, politics in the Schmidtian sense, the ability to distinguish between friends and enemies in a way it's an extension between his controversial uh, definition of sovereignty in political theology, it's the opening sentence that's so often cited. Sovereign is uh, the one who gets to the, who decides in the state of emergency or state of exception. It's it's an attempt to get away from all quote unquote normative concerns in politics or relic normative concerns, uh, constitutionalism, rule of law, uh, an appreciation of of the achievements of legal positivism. Uh, all of these so-called traditional normative considerations. Already in political theology, we know he's criticizing normative thinking uh, against the exception, which he, the state of exception, which he says is analogous to the miracle of theology. So you can see the background of political Catholicism in part, which is the title of a book he writes the next year on political Catholicism. But he's, he's excommunicated from the church uh, around 25, his marriage is dissolved. Um, and, you know, that just doesn't fly at the time. Uh, marriage is a sacrament. Uh, and he distances himself from political theology. So this is a, a purely sec, unlike, unlike the, 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 the book on political theology, he did, in 22, he distances himself from political Catholicism. He's no fan of the center party in, in the, the uh, you know, Democratic Party uh, in during the Weimar Republic, uh, which Catholics, you know, it's a Catholic interest party, which is very successful. It's the, it's kind of the kingmaker, the coalition key. 
And this is uh, an argument uh, nominally on the basis of realism in concept of the political. Uh, so it abstracts from all normative considerations uh, and value considerations. And because it considers those to be ideological, uh, an inadmissible interference in the logic of the political. Uh, ironically, there's a resemblance with positivism too, legal positivism, because for example, Hans Kelsen, uh, you know, Aust Austrian originally, uh, thought the virtue of legal positivism was that it kept, uh, you know, uh, uh, or ideological considerations out of the picture. You don't, you didn't judge the efficacy of a legal system on the basis of left or right, et cetera, but really on the basis of the, the formal, uh, its formal achievements, ability to uh, approve laws uh, and implement laws uh, according to the, the correct formula, formal stipulations of rule of law. So, uh, and, and, you know, normally the concept of political and the centrality of the friend enemy distinction is consistent with traditional, the traditional uh, ethos, let's call it, of German power politic, Machtpolitik, the Bismarck era, because uh, it, there's a phrase that goes along with, you know, the, the Second Empire and, and Bismarck, uh, Machtpolitik, uh, which is the primacy of foreign, primacy of foreign policy. This was a big point among German conservatives. Uh, traditionalists too during the Second Empire, which uh, collapsed in 19, 1918. So th there's continuity there too. Um, but the, the, the emphasis on uh, war, okay, as the, he calls it the ultima ratio, uh, uh, is also unquestionably uh, an indication or expression of the, let's call it the revanchist mentality. Uh, of the German right after the, the, the Versailles Treaty and the uh, you know uh, irredentist claims for territories that were lost, Germany was stripped of its colonies. It was uh, stripped of several other territories. Uh, these punitive measures, and it all has to do with you know, war guilt, right? And that's another reason Schmidt say the same things after World War uh, II. We know from his diaries then. So this there, there's a lot of consistency. Um, so uh, this is, a, 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 as you rightly indicate, a very important uh, development in his thought. And it's disputed in the secondary literature, but the emphasis on, you know, when he says the, the highlight of great politics is the moment when the enemy comes, this, this is a, a metaphor from, uh, you know, Kampf or battle. Uh, he's using the, the, the imagery of a rifle sight. Schmidt never saw front action in World War I, be that as it may. Um, when the enemy comes into concrete view or clarity as the enemy, it's, it's the rifle sight. You know, when we see the, 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 the so-called whites of the enemy's eyes, we, we, we start to fire, um, not to overinterpret. But this is a, a military metaphor. So there are comparisons that are made with Ernst Jung and the aestheticization of, uh, of, of war. Uh, which was Walter Benjamin's critique, but but there 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 are uh, you know Schmidt scholars who dispute that the, the parallels with Jung are are really relevant. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned earlier uh, how Schmidt um, sort of influenced American politics in the wake of nine eleven, and I think the most uh, the most obvious um, I guess statement uh, in regards to the foreign enemy distinction is uh, from George W. Bush, the president, when he says, "You're either with us or against us." So, with that, following up on that, um, uh, to what extent is Carl Schmidt influencing, um, I guess, the current American political landscape today? Well, you know, uh, I doubt, and I'm sure you'd agree with me here, that. that George W. Bush ever read a line of Carl Schmidt. Mm -hmm. And in the aftermath of 9-11, of course, much scrutiny was uh, accorded to the influence of the late University of Chicago political theorist, Leo Strauss, mm -hmm. who knew Schmidt, uh, studied with him, and uh, wrote a very important critique of the concept of the political, which is included in the English language edition. But uh, 
So at the time, I, I'm not sure, you know, Schmidt's influence was determinate, but, but it certainly was in the discussion and it, in, uh, because of the notion of the state of exception. And of course, there were books written at the time, one by uh, Richard Posner, uh, the Harvard political, I'm sorry, uh, legal scholar, uh, Adrian uh, Vermoel, uh, uh, about justifying the state of exception. There's a uh, kind of an efflorescence of constitutional literature, of course, at the time, exploring the uh, parameters of the state of exception. And of course, someone like John Yu in the uh, Department of Defense mm -hmm. is elaborating his theory of the unity executive, yes. which comes back with Trump mm -hmm. uh, in a way that if the president uh, decrees it to be so, it is so, uh, you know, which I mean, so much for separation of powers and, and constitutionalism, mm -hmm. et cetera, if that's the case. Uh, and, and, you know, so at the time, there, there was quite a discussion of Schmidt. Same time, there was a left-wing discussion of Schmidt with uh, you know, uh, the, the rise of left-wing authoritarian populism in the early 2000s uh, uh, under Chavez uh, in, in Venezuela, other cases, and the representatives of this current of course were Chantal Mouffe uh, and Ernesto uh, Laclau. Uh, today, the discussion, as I you know, in, indicated briefly earlier, is uh, just as relevant in a different sense, namely uh, Schmidt's prophecies uh, or insights about the uh, contradictory nature of liberalism and democracy, uh, how Schmidt defines democracy uh, in a prejudicial way, in fact, as depending on homogeneity or, or sameness, which of course, you know, coming back into fashion uh, regrettably with notions of ethnic democracy and the primis, primacy of the ethnos uh, mm -hmm. over the demos. Um, and and uh, we see this all over among, especially among uh, Europe's uh, anti-immigrant far right parties. And of course, in a, in a wing of the Republican party in the alt right in, in the US uh, where Schmidt is also very popular. So this fascination with dictatorship, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, inefficacious uh, conduct of political uh, affairs under uh, liberal democracy. It's, it's hesitancies, it's confusions, it's, it's indebtedness to uh, interest uh, and, and the, the specter of ungovernability, shall we say, is makes make Schmidt like, once again very topical, um, but for the right and 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 for the left. Mm -hmm. um, I believe um, we are now observing a wave of uh, intellectuals who are who identify themselves as post liberal, and you know, Patrick Deneen is the most famous name among this. He recently wrote a book called "Regime Change Towards a Post Liberal Future." Um, and of course, you mentioned uh, Adrian uh, Vermeule. Uh, I always pronounce him as Vermeule, who wrote a book called Common Good Constitutionalism, in which uh, right. he rejected the, I guess, both the liberal and the conservative notion of constitutionalism, the way I read it. Um, so what what uh, Deneen and Vermeule and other thinkers, too, have in common uh, is that they are religious and particularly Catholic. Um, obviously, you can include people like Yoram Amazoni, who's Jewish, and uh, mm -hmm. others too. But uh, they all believe that um, you know the Enlightenment concept of liberalism has failed us, and you know, we need a different blueprint, so to speak. Um, so, to give uh, these thinkers their due, um, what do you believe are some of the ways in which? Uh, liberal democracy, I guess, if not, you know, failed, but uh, I guess, um, how you call it, um, triggers these backlash. Yes. Well, this is, uh, there have always been, in the history of, of American conservatism during, at the time of World War II, 
with the America First Committee, which was non-interventionist and, and you know, implicitly or often explicitly pro-German, tried to prevent America's entry in the war, and the history of American conservatism, the John Birch Society in the 50s, there have always been uh, representatives who are uh, against the freedoms of constitutionalism, liberal democracy, and the you know, uh, enforce, enforcement of civil liberties, uh, et cetera. And, in, in, and, and of course, now with the figures you mentioned, um, the, the Catholic uh, national conservatives, sometimes they're referred to, this strand of thought is uh, coming back into fashion or at least among intellectuals, uh, a lot of attention has been given to uh, Vermeule or Vermeule's uh, notion uh, of common good conservatism. This is a, a, a stunning kind of repeat or replay. Uh, Vermeule uh, converted to Catholicism 10 years ago or so. He's a, he's a convert uh, and is a self-described integralist. This is a reference, specific allusion to the uh, leading uh, Catholic, uh, to Action Francaise and Jean Maurras, which comes into being during the Dreyfus period of the late 1890s. And, and similarly, uh, Action Francaise, very influential among French intellectuals uh, on the right, uh, you know, held, adhered to this counter revolutionary argument uh, that, that, uh, the French Revolution, secularism, and, and respect for um, human rights uh, is really the the is sinful and evil, uh, and should be overturned at all costs. Uh, and and many of these arguments are coming back into fashion. Uh, Schmidt Schmidt implied them in political Catholicism, in part, and uh, now because of the ungovern apparent ungovernability uh, of the liberal state, uh, their conservatives having given up on neoconservatism, uh, whose bankruptcy that needed further proof uh, you know, was, was uh, demonstrated by both the uh, you know, Iraq war, um, which it was uh, in favor, uh, but also the economic uh, Great Recession of 2008. Um, these are indices that uh, traditional neo American neoconservatism, the dominant school, one might say, uh, in the post-war period is no longer viable. So there, there's a, a search for options. And, and of course, the turn to, shall we say, integralism and this common good conservatism of Vermeule, which is basically, uh, I mean, look at the Supreme Court. Uh, there are uh, three very influential Catholic justices who are against abortion and really want to, uh, you know, clearly undo uh, the, uh, you know, prerogatives and advances uh, of the, the Warren Court, the Burger Court, for example. Uh, they, they are unsympathetic to the so-called administrative state uh, as it came into being under Roosevelt and the New Deal, et cetera. And, and we'll have a lot of battles uh, along those lines uh, in the you know, months and years to come. So, th but, but, but it's, it's, a, it's an approach uh, that's oriented toward absolute values. Uh, so it's a return of political, a species of political Catholicism that in a way was developed in the 20s and 30s. Um, Max Scheler, uh, on whom Pope uh, Jean-Paul II uh, wrote his, uh, the, the Polish Pope, uh, uh, Wojtyla, wrote his dissertation, um, that there are absolute values and uh, liberalism is inherently dis disintegrative and incoherent. And also the secularism uh, is, is insupportable from a moral standpoint uh, and it's uh, uh, devolves into chaos inevitably with this, this uh, morass of competing interests, or at least this is how it's portrayed. So we, we, we need, uh, you know, you hear this all over, all over the, the polemics against, uh, you know, uh, 
liberal education today, and and also against uh, you know uh, quote unquote uh, and, and lifestyles or life choices that don't follow these uh, you know right wing conservative patriarchal views. This is all of a piece with the uh, value preferences of political Catholicism historically, uh, and they're also prominent components of the, the rise of the new Catholic integralism that bears par important parallels with Schmidt's ideas on political Catholicism. Schmidt was a, a very astute reader of Shaw Malas and learned a lot from Oxenham Ponsez uh, going back to the early 20s. Now, one thing that really uh, stood out when I uh, was researching Schmidt is that his uh, his views on Thomas Hobbes and Hobbesianism is uh, in many ways distinct from, I guess, the established liberal way of uh, viewing Hobbes. Whereas there's a line of thinkers that flow from uh, Locke to John Rawls that emphasize the social contract. Now, Schmidt um, is uh, reviving the idea of the, the Leviathan, which is what Hobbes primarily focus on. So in, in some ways he's battling the us revisionists and he's going back to the original. Um, and thus his fascination with um, absolute dictatorship. But nevertheless, as you've uh, alluded to, um, a form that form of Hobbesian dictatorship can be justified in some ways as truly democratic because uh, Again, I think Rousseau alluded to this as well. Is the is that well the the state, the sovereign, is the representative of the will of the people, and that's why countries like uh, uh, North Korea can call itself the Democratic People's Republic of Korea if they adhere to that particular description of democracy. So, um, why don't you elaborate more on how Schmidt views this form of uh, dictatorship as you know as more democratic than say parliamentary democracy, which he was against. Yeah, I think this this was a strategic argument in part that Schmidt had to make during the 1920s when he basically assumed that he was stuck with the Weimar Republic and that the, this Reichstag, uh, you know, would, would uh, endure. And of course, this is he addresses some of these considerations uh, about the, the bases of sovereignty, both in the book on dictatorship, but also in his most important work in the late 20s, the Verfassungslehre uh, of Theory of the Constitution, uh, where he goes back to and reviews the origins of uh, democratic approaches to sovereignty. Uh, yeah, Schmidt, of course he denigrates contract theory, that the idea that one could, uh, as do traditional German conservatives, that the will, the will of all uh, uh, of the people uh, could be uh, represented somehow through, uh, through representative government, that this would suffice. It would uh, cancel or negate democracy because of the you know, conjuries of competing interests, economic interests. Uh, Schmidt is also a, a important critic of uh, economic laissez-faire and technology in the, in the 20s, uh, partly influenced under the influence of Max Weber, Max Weber's critique of uh, rationalization and disenchantment. What Schmidt admires about Hobbes uh, is, to begin with, Hobbes' uh, realism as embodied in the formula uh, expressed in Latin, uh, uh, authority, not uh, right or law, uh, authority makes the law, okay? Uh, and uh, this is a recipe for, uh, you know, some kind of form of plebiscitary democracy where the, uh, this is Rousseau's critique of Hobbes. In fact, uh, they both, Rousseau has a Hobbesian point of departure that uh, once the uh, you know, citizens forfeit uh, right or endow the uh, political authority or sovereign um, with, with right, 
uh, or sovereignty, uh, then the sovereign, the decisions of the sovereign uh, to protect right, uh, to protect life, and require obedience uh, is absolute. Okay, because once it starts, once one begins to erode it, uh, as liberal institutions do, as as the provisos for uh, civic liberties do, detracts from the omnipotence of the state. Uh, and especially in an era of total war, Germany, uh, well, they lost World War I on the battlefield. It lost World War I on the battlefield. But of course, at the end, there was a civil war uh, in, in October and November of 1918, which uh, you know, made continuing uh, on the battlefield impossible. So this is the dimension uh, of Hobbes' thinking that, that uh, Schmidt identifies with the Hobbes as a theorist of absolutism. So you might, one might say the continental Hobbes or the, the Hobbes that resembles the French uh, political thinker of sovereignty, uh, Jean Baudin. Uh, but uh, just a final footnote here, uh, Schmidt in his Hobbes book of 1937 has a very interesting discussion of, of Hobbes' uh, other main book that's rarely read this short treatise on behemoth uh, about the civil war. And for Schmidt, this attests to the ungovernability of uh, democratic uh, sovereignty or representative democracy, because uh, once one, this is Schmidt's traditional polemic against civil society, the separation of state and society. Uh, and at, he says in the opening sentence of uh, 1933, this book on state, movement, and people, this first important intervention uh, during the Nazi era, well, book, book like intervention, that, uh, you know, on J January 30th, 1933, Hegel died in Germany. Um, it doesn't mean he's an anti Hegelian, but what it means, what, what he's referring to is the uh, so called the Reichstag, the constitutional state, and the separation between. Uh, the state and civil society, the Germans, uh, that, that tension, Schmidt is convinced is unworkable, at least the civil war, okay, because of the, the competing interests and inability to distinguish between friend and enemy. And, and enemy. Uh, hence, uh, uh, Schmidt is sympathetic to this program of eviscerating civil society, according it. And, and separation of powers is also uh, a horror show for Schmidt. But, but to guarantee this, just real quick, he, he has to come back to this notion of uh, ethnic homogeneity. And he, and he uses this argument already, both in uh, the second edition of the Critique of Parliamentary Democracy in 1926 and the concept of political, he uses the euphemism uh, in German, it's Art Gleichheit which means sameness of kind. And it's a euphemism for uh, ethnic homogeneity. He praises uh, Australia's policy at the time, this is 1926, of uh, refusing to uh, naturalize or, or uh, have non-white immigrants. So this, it's hard to make these arguments in a way uh, for Schmidt uh, in the 1920s, given the, the political framework of the Weimar Republic. Uh, so, but, but, you know, when the floodgates opened uh, with Hitler's accession of power in 1933, uh, you know, all these uh, restrictions and, and uh, you know, hesit hesitancies uh, can go by the board and, and he can uh, feel free to uh, take this concept of uh, ethnic homogeneity, uh, uh, sameness of kind, uh, and, and make that an important part of his theory. And that's how you can get the sovereign as representative, according to Schmidt. This is Schmidt's notion of representation, <clears throat> that where the sovereign is representative of, of the, the people. It's a, it's a, I would call it a debased Rousseauianism because it's totally devoid of mediating institutions and protections for the individual. Rousseau opens the social contract with a protest against uh, the, the violation uh, of, uh, individual rights, uh, violation of the conception of uh, humanity uh, because of uh, 
despotism. Okay, so he's interested in remedying that via the solution of, of uh, you know, self-determination. Okay. Schmidt isn't involved, interested in self-determination or popular sovereignty. Uh, he's interested in, in dictatorship and, and uh, quelling the interferences of public opinion, the public sphere. Uh, he wants the state to control the media, uh, et cetera. Uh, and and uh, he's very active in Nazi law, Nazi uh, legal debates in the first three years of the Nazi dictatorship, 33 to 36, in terms of uh, suppressing individual rights and civil liberties, which he believes is a slippery slope to civil war. Uh, and that's, as, as one can already glean from, from a Hobbes time, supposedly, with the English Civil War, um, you know, once the, the uh, uh, king is over, overthrown or executed in 1641. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think on that note, uh, we can end on that. Thank you very much again, Professor Richard Wolin, for joining this program. Thank you for inviting me, John.